Welcome back to another episode of Podward State. I am one of your hosts, Grace Cunningham. And I'm Shannon Smith. Today we have Jared Audrick on the show. Um, he's a former Penn State defensive tackle, and he just had a new documentary come out on YouTube called Am I Crazy? Um, that explores CTE and the country's relationship with football. Um, it was a really good episode. We're excited for you guys to do Yeah, it was an awesome episode. Joining us now, we have former Penn State defensive tackle and creator of the new documentary, Am I Crazy? Jared Audrick. Jared, how are you? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're excited. So getting right into it, how did you end up at Penn State? Football. Um, (laughs) I ended up at Penn State because I I was playing football in high school and I was able to uh, play well enough that I got recruited across the nation by uh, almost every major division one school uh, had about 70 some odd offers uh, to play football. And uh, I started taking visits to different universities and one of the universities was Penn State. And there was a defensive line coach named Coach Larry Johnson that was very influential in my choice. And uh, and yeah, he kind of hit me with the proposition because I was getting recruited really hard by Florida at the time. And uh, Florida was, they had a lot of energy. They had a lot of really great players and they had Urban Meyer there. And uh, it was kind of assumed they were about to win a national championship. And Coach Johnson asked me, you know, do you want to go to Florida and have fun or do you want to come to Penn State and be great? And I was like, oh, <laughs> he, got, he got me. So uh So I ended up at Penn State that way. And I grew up in central Pennsylvania, or I should say southeastern Pennsylvania, and, uh, you know, tried resisting the blue and white cult as much as I could, but couldn't. So did you grow up as a Penn State fan? I did not, no. Um, I was, you know, a lot of people around me were, but growing up when I was a kid, I was more of a, a pro sports fan. But then obviously, or I shouldn't say obviously, but as I got older, I became more and more of a, collegiate sports fan but um but yeah I was never uh, a lot of family and friends of the family were Penn State fans and you know gung-ho and uh but I had to convince my mom that that was the decision that I really wanted to make because she was almost anti Penn State just because of we were she felt surrounded by it right do you have a favorite memory from Penn State as a player and then as a student yeah, I mean, it was pretty cool winning the, uh, I mean, that wasn't at Penn State. I was playing for Penn State at the time when we won the bowl game against LSU. I mean, playing out in the Rose Bowl was cool too against USC, but at Penn State, probably, it all feels like one big memory of like winning a game, leaving the stadium and going to see family and friends that came up, uh, eating tailgate food, everybody kind of stopping you wanting to eat their tailgate food. And then going from there and straight back to uh, Nittany Apartments and uh, drinking a fifth of vodka. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, I mean, um, that's probably the best memory. And then the follow up was what? Uh, As a student, do you have like a favorite memory um, being a student here? Yeah, sure. I always mispronounce her name. Uh, she's used to it, though. Dr. Dianunda. She was a sociology teacher. Um, while I was there, I'm not sure if she's there anymore. But she just always encouraged so much class class discussion. Uh, and, you know, I was a bit of an instigator, uh, as you, I guess you can see, if you watch the film. Uh, and she encouraged that. And so... I always thought that was cool. She was a really cool teacher. She just encouraged a lot of participation and hand raising. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, as a student, it was probably those courses that allowed me to act most naturally. Um, yeah, probably her classes and sociology classes that I got really interested in. But yeah, it was probably that as a student that uh, those participatory classes. 
So after Penn State, you were drafted by the Miami Dolphins in 2010. What was the process of getting drafted like for you? Well, it really is a process. It kind of feels like you're on a conveyor belt uh, more than anything. Uh, because if you're drafted in the first round, which I was projected to either be first first round or early second round, and you know I was invited to Radio City Music Hall in New York and did the whole, uh, uh, I guess, spiel, as they say, um, going up on stage, doing the whole ceremony of getting drafted, had my family there. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're doing that, um, you know, you're kind of just on this like perpetual red carpet for like a month or two. And, you know, people are inviting you places, taking your picture, giving you free stuff all the time uh, because you're walking into this uh, massive multi-billion dollar conglomerate where people want you to associate their products with you and their business with you. And so, uh, yeah, it kind of felt like you were on this conveyor belt and you were kept giving, you know, free stuff. Uh, but I mean, the, the process of the draft, really when that actually happens and commences, uh, you know, you're done with college football, you're, you're done with all the, the combine performance stuff. Um, and it really just comes down to, you know, shaking babies and kissing hands. So once you got down to Miami and started playing with the Dolphins, did you made, uh, did you like notice a big difference playing um, professional football from playing college football? At each level, there's a jump. There's a, a jump in either skill or competition, strength especially. Um, and it, it seemed like at first uh, when I practiced with the Miami Dolphins, they were asking me to, to play a different position than I had played at Penn State. They're asking me to play in a totally different type of defense. So it requested that I move different. Uh, and because of that, I, I struggled at practice, you know, because you have insulated practices amongst your team, you know, for months until, you know, you play uh, an opponent. And we had the best left tackle in the league at the time, Jeff, Jake Long, who I played across from, uh, you know, as a defensive end. And I had to learn a new position, a new scheme, a new body movement over top of the best left tackle in the league. And so he kind of felt like, you know, superhuman, like he was super strong. But what I figured out was that, you know, there's college guys that are stronger than the pro guys. It's just that the pro guys have a process. Everybody has an individual process. Everybody knows where they should be. The game gets faster because everybody's focusing on their compartmentalized uh, position and job and role which obviously you know creates a cohesive unit but I think what made everybody faster and stronger was their professionalism uh and that there was no classes to take there were no uh you know walks across campus no schoolgirls, you know distracting you from from uh from playing football, you know? So I think it was the professionalism that made everything faster. So yeah, there was definitely a, a difference and there were a whole lot more things to contend with. I mean, uh, having an apartment paid for you and kind of arranged for you at Penn State because you're on full scholarship, um, you know, I never had to deal with an exchange of money, you know, signing a lease really, it was all just kind of taken care of. So then when you move to a place like Miami where and you, you're given, you know, a massive amount of money, at least compared to what you came from, uh, there's a lot more variables at play. You know, you kind of break out of that, uh, out of the, uh, out of that, like kind of like childlike glaze you have over your eyes once you're out. So, um, so yeah, there was a big jump. So switching gears a little bit, you have some credits in um, some films and TV series. So how did you get started in the film industry? And was it always something that you were interested in, even at Penn State? Or was it just sort of a later interest that you developed? I think my interest in film uh, was pretty apparent since I was a kid. Um, my dad always, you know, got, got pretty involved whenever he watched a movie. He was always seeking out meaning. Uh, in films and in stories in general. Uh, when I was a kid, he was pretty, he was pretty big in the scripture and finding uh, 
uh, you know, finding the moral or the meaning of a story or of a given parable. And so I think the same thing ended up happening with movies whenever I, you know, find some time with them. You know, my parents lived in different places. And so I got to spend time with my dad sparingly. But whenever I did, he was he was always really adamant about watching movies with me. And uh, and I think that kind of, you know, transferred over to me. And I was always in my room with my mom, who, you know, I'm her only child. So I was always in my room watching, you know, uh, DVDs on my on my PlayStation and like going into different worlds and and then I took a class in high school called film is art and I didn't realize that you could make art I didn't realize that you know you could make such a statement um, or derive such metaphor or paint a picture um, or really deal with poetry or any of those things that you know can kind of come all together in that type of medium uh, and so it was it was it was probably since then that I wanted to like do something in that realm. Uh, and I, and I grew a, an extra appreciation for it since then, but I got into the industry, I think just because, you know, people think sports and entertainment are separate. They're really the same entity. Um, although the agents do get a major difference in, uh, acting versus, uh, football. Um, but yeah, I think it was, I signed my deal, my free agent deal with the Jaguars in 2015. And uh, a part of that, I kind of did some bucket list stuff, which was like, I wanted to drive a Porsche and live in LA for a little bit. <laughs> and so I kind of did that. And in doing that, went to a Lakers game, started training with this trainer. He took me to a Lakers game and there was a movie producer there, uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, that came up to me and asked me, you know, what the hell I was doing in, in LA. And I said, trying to speak to people like you. And uh, and he was like, oh, I want you to audition for my movie. And at the time, it was a, a, a movie with uh, the Vin Diesel series called Triple X. And um, I said, when is it? And he's like, tomorrow. And I'm like, I've never done one of these. Like, what, what, what you know? So I went and did it and um, got a really positive reaction from the uh, from the uh, uh, casting director. And the casting director liked it so much that she called three agencies for me because I told her I wasn't rep by anybody. And so she called three agencies um, and I ended up taking a few meetings while I was out there, but I was about to return to start playing for the Jaguars, this new team that I had signed with professionally. So um, I kind of, you know, made a, 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 a verbal agreement to be with this one management company and uh, we started talking about potential hiatus projects, which means like whenever you're done with the season that you go do something in the entertainment or acting realm and then go back. And so it started there. Uh, but then when I was done playing for the Jaguars, um, I was asked into the writer's room uh, for Ballers, a series that I kind of cameoed on as a player, which really didn't take much acting at all. But uh but yeah, I was asked into the writer's room and I became a writing consultant for, I think, season five of Ballers. So that was uh, quite a learning experience, too. So when you were on Ballers, what was it like to be a part of that show? What was it like? Yeah, what was it like, I guess, on the acting side of it and then also in the writer's room and like transitioning from um, being on the show to then writing for it? Well, that's what I wanted. I didn't want to be a, you know, a cardboard cutout. Right. Because that's what you essentially get invited there for, you know, as a player is to kind of be a prop to make the world real. Right. They wanted real players, you know, to kind of because it was the same producer and creator from Entourage. And they took the same model from Entourage, which was litter the scenes with celebrities in L.A. to make the world real around these actors playing celebrities. And so uh, they did the same thing with football. Right. Where uh you know they would invite these these athletes including me to come onto the show and kind of you know do these like one-liners like real stiffly and you're just like hey that's not a healthy breakfast you know and stuff like that and so i just i i kind of i put my phone down from taking a selfie on set you know that i saw a lot of the players doing i think i cameoed like three times and each time i saw you know players just kind of happy to be there and I just had this feeling where it's like, you know, I want to be more than a cardboard cutout. And so I walked straight up to the the director and uh, producer and up to The Rock. 
uh, all at different times where I said, hey, you know, I'm really appreciative of being here, but I'd love to participate in a larger capacity if that's possible. But I don't, I don't want to step on people's toes. I know you have a, you know, production. I know you have a crew. I know you have writers, but it feels like something that I would want to to do. And so when I was done, uh, I kind of let um, Steve Levinson, the creator, know, and uh, him and one of his assistants hit me up, and I went out to LA and and. Uh, you know, started helping out. So I just, I just was very forward about it. I was forward that I wanted to do more and that I wanted to, and I wanted to present more value than, you know, giving a thumbs up. Very cool. So you mentioned it a little, but what was the rock like in real life? Are you guys still friends? Yeah, we fish every Tuesday. Um, <laughs> he makes my tea. I, <laughs> I rub his shoulders. Um, no, um, yeah, no, we're not, we're not friends. Uh, no, we were, we were, you know, he was very cordial. He's very nice dude. Um, you know, probably overly gracious, um, which has got to be tiring. Um, but yeah, no, he was cool. He was cool. You know, I'd asked him for advice and I think he kind of gave me some, I forget. It must not have been that great of advice, but, uh, but he, uh, yeah, he was, he was a good dude, hardworking. It was like every time he wasn't doing a scene, he was on his phone doing something else. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, uh, there's, there's sometimes where it's like, you know, there's a, there's a fine line between art and hustle, uh, or there's a clear line between it. And, uh, and he was, he was a hardworking dude. He was a hardworking dude. So then you made an appearance in the film Samaritan with Sylvester Stallone. How did getting that role come about? That same management company that I had told you about that I signed with, um, you know, eventually got me an agent uh, and I was repped. Uh, I guess that's kind of standard out in L.A. where it's like if you're trying to get into that, you want a manager and uh, an agent. So you have an agency and a management company. I mean, that just sounds like more percentages to me, but um, it's worked out so far. Um, yeah, I got that. I was on the East Coast. Uh, I think I was interviewing people for the documentary. And, um, and so you would get these mobile uh, uh, auditions and that you could set up your own camera and send it in, you know, instead of being in the room. And I did one of those in my hometown of Lebanon, Pennsylvania, at my buddy's uh, recording studio. Um, he records music there, but I set up a camera and, and uh, I did an audition, sent it in, just like all the other auditions. You might not hear anything back and I didn't hear anything back, so I didn't think anything of it. And then while I was out in Montana, uh, interviewing a series of neuroscientists for the documentary, I got word back, I got a call from my manager saying I got the part. And I said, oh, that's cool. Uh, and so they're like, but we need you on set in Atlanta in 48 hours. I said, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and so I was in literally uh, in the middle of nowhere. I was in Big Sky, Montana. And uh, so I had to fly directly to Atlanta. And as soon as I landed, you know, I got there, they got me, you know, I signed a bunch of papers. And then the first thing I'm doing is driving a car behind 74 year old Sylvester Stallone and and they're saying just don't hit them but i end up finding out after i do that 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 was actually supposed to be the stunt driver driving the car and the stunt guy who i had a i had a stunt double but he wasn't there for some reason there was this kind of miscommunication in the production and so i was doing what i'm not sure you know anybody's gonna get in trouble but <laughs> i was uh not supposed to be driving that car that close to their uh crown jewel Sylvester Stallone so uh so I got the role just from an audition and didn't hear back and so I just kind of kept marching and then I got a call so I was like all right cool very cool so you just mentioned it a little bit but you have a new documentary documentary called am I crazy that focuses on CTE and the country's relationship with football so can you explain a little bit more about the documentary you know it started when I was you know trying to figure out if I wanted to be done with football or not 
and uh you know you you myself but people in general seem to be motivated by narrative more than you know kind of pure raw information or data and because of that i was looking for new narratives or narratives of former players going on to do something that i felt was respectable or that i was interested in and uh and so i just started looking that up but when i kept putting in former player what I saw more often than not was former player CTE, former player bankrupt, former player CTE, former player CTE. I'm like, wait, you know, what's going on here? I, I knew that uh, about vaguely about uh, this uh, acronym, uh, but I didn't know much about it past the Will Smith movie that was produced uh, called Concussion. I think what it came out what like 2014 or 15, and so. Uh, so yeah, it was kind of like, you know, and I had seen that movie when I was still playing for the Jags. I almost went into the theater like I was watching a snuff film, you know, like I was going to watch like a, a dirty movie because it was like, it was kind of sacrosanct or, or sacrilegious. It was sacrilegious to, you know, it felt sacrilegious that you were going to watch this film that might turn your values on how you felt about football. And there I am, I just signed a contract to find a deal with the Jaguars. Like, I better be motivated when I return to practice tomorrow. Um, so, um, so yeah, I started. I started, but when I was finished, I actually cut my my playing time with the Jaguars. Uh, it was cut short in about two and a half years. I finished a five year contract, uh, and I was in Toronto trying to figure out uh, what what to do, who to be, and I kept seeing CT over and over again, and. Uh, it wasn't like this instant reaction to going to interview people, but I eventually ended up in Brooklyn where all creatives go. Uh, but I ended up in Brooklyn where, uh, where I was trying to write a script. I was writing a movie script, a film script, a screenplay with a local writer and director in Brooklyn. And I, the log line for this script was the day before the biggest game of his career, an NFL player realizes his dreams will never come true. And I, I wanted to make it about this football player about to uh, go play this playoff game, this NFL playoff game. Um, but he's had this secret that he's wanted to do something else for a long time. And I think at the time in the script, it was like he wanted to sing opera, uh, which was like something, you know, kind of quasi embarrassing in a locker room setting. And so um, he got word of this audition that he could go do, but he was locked inside the team hotel on this away game. Uh, and he had the, the game the next morning. And so what ends up happening to this guy who tries escaping the hotel to go do the audition uh, is that he, there's all these kind of like, uh, I guess, uh, you know, psychological and supernatural things happening in the hotel that's stopping him from getting out. And so as we were writing it, I think, you know, you know, we, we have a full script still, but as we were writing it, we said, you know, I want some real life valence to this. You know, I want some real life uh, value. And I'm like, well, there's a CTE proposed neurodegenerative disease. And I want to find out what the, uh, uh, what the, the, all the symptoms or disease process is. And so, um, because I want to incorporate it in the film. I want to give this, you know, weird feeling. So uh, we decided like, well, what better than to go ask these scientists who seem to be all over the place and wanting attention, you know, uh, to sit down for an interview so we can like create this as a part of the pitch package for this, for this, uh, for this film, for this script. And so we went, took a camera crew from Brooklyn and, uh, and when I did my first interview with uh, Dr. Bob Stern at the Boston University CTE Research Center, I was really, really surprised by how little data or information or understanding there was. And it kind of just set me off on a totally different path. And I said, you know, wow, like, wait a second, this is what I want to be doing. I want to be in the room. I want to be asking these questions because it doesn't, it didn't feel like I was getting really good answers from somebody who's been on national media over and over again, talking about this disease, but he really had nothing to say. I'm like, there's a discrepancy here. What's, what's going on? And so I wanted, to, I was, I was really, I was physically upset because I was like, wait a second, like 
this can't be right. This can't be it. And it felt like there was like a glitch in the matrix. And so I was like, what's going on? And so I knew that I wanted to do that. I wanted to make a documentary film from then on. And I kind of just threw the script out. I was like, I want to do this because I'm in the room because I'm actually engaging people. And uh, that's how it came about. And that was the 28th summer of 2018. And here we are, uh, you know, winter of 2023. So what was the process of making the documentary and meeting with people to interview um, for it? Well, uh, it, it varied. Some people were very responsive. Some people were very elusive. Uh, some people, I, you know, I, I went all the way to Australia to meet with a neuroscientist that had a pretty unique opinion about CTE, and he didn't want to be seen on camera. Uh, and he was pretty weary of me. Um, now, it was a good excuse to go to Australia, but at the same time, you know, I traveled across the world to go to Australia to meet this guy who was scared to speak on camera, so I didn't bring any cameras, but I ended up leaving the United States to meet a neuroscientist in the parking lot of a Texas roadhouse in Australia. And it's like, he, he didn't want to go inside, like he was that paranoid. Uh, about his opinion getting out there or his face being on, on anything uh, because of his opinion. He was scared of not getting funding anymore for any of his stuff because of his opinion. Um, so, I mean, that was one guy that was receptive but elusive in a way. Then there was other people that responded right away and wanted to be on camera, like, uh, you know, Mark Gordon, who Dr. Mark Gordon, who's in the film. Uh, if you guys saw the film, you know, he's in L.A., and the culture of LA is like cameras everywhere. And it's like, if you're gonna be a doctor in LA, well then you get better get used to, you know, being on film. And so, uh, so yeah, he was kind of gung ho and, and responsive, you know, I think he was on like Joe Rogan and everything. So he does the whole show business thing, uh, but as an endocrinologist. And then there was uh, the anthropologist and, uh, and wartime journalist, Sebastian Younger. Um, where it took a year for me to get a response from him. And then it took two years to actually sit down and interview him. So he's pretty elusive. He didn't even want the cameras rolling at all outside of his home. He didn't want anybody knowing where he lived. He got a lot of backlash for uh, his book, Tribe, and where he re-described PTSD uh, through his eyes and the people that he served with over in Afghanistan. And so... Um, so yeah, he, he got a lot of backlash for him redefining uh, PTSD through his lens and, you know, kind of uh, creating or helping push uh, a new definition that may help people, uh, I guess, deal with what, the, what happens when they get back from war. So there was all types of, I mean, it was a lot of writing, it was a lot of reading, it was a lot of getting familiar with people's literature, if they had scientific literature, with their books, if they read books, you know, whether, I mean, if they wrote books. Um, yeah, there was neuroscientists who I read their book and didn't get a hold of. There was neuroscientists that I read their book and I got a hold of and we interviewed like Dr. Dale Bredesen. Um, yeah, so it was really just creating a bridge from my efforts to their efforts and what they had laid down and creating enough context between the two of us uh, and showing a knowledge and understanding of their work so that they would give me the time to sit down and that it would be a fruitful endeavor. So what would you say was the hardest part in making the film? Uh, legal. <laughs> um, you know, I released this on, or we released this on YouTube doing part to just all the different legal hoops and ramifications that you have to come if come across if you wanna sell the film. Uh, we still might do some type of distribution deal. Uh, we'll see if that's still on the table, even though we put it out on YouTube. Uh, but that's mainly, you know, what I was upset with was, you know, and took a lot of the steam out of the project was how long the project sat in legal review because large corporations don't wanna purchase anything or distribute anything uh, that could get them in potential legal trouble. And I think that's kind of the problem with, you know, uh, making something that you wanna sell and making something that you wanna express. And, um, and I think that's where a lot of people get caught up. Uh, 
with their art or with their opinions in general, that they're, they're more scared of being, you know, socially or financially ostracized uh, after making something, uh, especially for so long and putting so much of their resources into it, because it was totally funded by, by me. Like there was no other funding source. And so of course, when that happens and you're spending a lot of money uh, to make all this happen, um, you know, from hotels to flights, trains, rental cars, equipment, cameras, lenses, uh, labor, uh, you know, all the different things that add up. Uh, but for it, for it to got, it, it, I think it got stuck in legal for almost a year and it just took a lot of the, the steam that we had uh, built up. And so that was the toughest part for me. Uh, I was sending a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, four letter words to people um around that time in text messages you know emphasizing it holding the blue text down longer so it gets slammed into your text uh and so uh yeah that was probably the toughest part was just seeing all the things that it's really what exposed uh censorship to me censorship to me seems like legal right censorship is the 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 legalities uh, that go into getting onto a large platform. Um, and this was obviously a sensitive topic and obviously dealing with, uh, uh, there's, you know, subtle implications of, you know, whether it's uh, a certain university, pharmaceutical industry, NFL, all these things are kind of implied. You know, we, you know, we got a warning from the WWE you know, so like we had all types of warnings and that's what corporations do. They kind of set out their sentinels and, uh, and, you know, through the algorithms and they protect themselves from individual voices. So what's been the feedback since the documentary come out and how have people um, been reacting to it? I think it's generally been positive. Uh, I think it's generally been positive. I think a lot of people are, uh, you know, some people are saying that they're, it's refreshing to hear a different perspective on CTE and brain injury and sport in general. Um, and novelty wasn't necessarily the focus, but it was definitely something we knew that could have a residual positive effect on people. Um, you know, once we got into the weeds of, of the literature and interviewing people and then, you know, kind of creating a uh, you know, some uh, some dramatized content surrounding the interviews. Um, but yeah. Uh, have have any football players kind of reached out to you to give their, like, that have watched yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, so actually I just got a message today from a former teammate at Penn State, you know, who, you know, I got a couple of those from Penn State guys where it's like, you know, I've questioned a lot of my, I've questioned my sanity myself, you know, it's a message I got today. Um, and I think that's, those are, you know, some of the greatest conversations that you can have is like when people realize, uh, you know, that, or when you realize that people are having those types of conversations with themselves, that they're having some sort of internal dialogue, I think is very important um, because it shows that there's some type of differentiation between self and the information that's coming at you, whether through your phone or through your social groups or whatever it is. and. Um, so yeah, I mean, teammates have reached out, uh, being you know scared. Teammates have reached out uh, with uh, positivity in reaching new conclusions after watching the film. I think there's a lot of people that have watched like the first three episodes because it's broken down into eight episodes, and I think there's a lot of people that have watched the first three episodes and like they want to associate with the film, but then don't watch the rest of it. They grab onto, they latch onto something that they uh, they they're familiar with, and then leave it at, leave it at that. Um, and then, because a lot of times you can tell when people haven't watched the film and the things that they say, you know, very much like a professor and like saying, "Well, what do you think of the book?" or an author, "What do you think of the book?" and they start spewing bullshit, where it's like they wanted to associate with, and I think a lot of people wanted to associate with the idea of a player creating his own narrative, the empowerment of that idea is I think where people latch onto and then they actually don't get into the context of the rest of the film. But there's a lot of people that watch the whole film and there's a, a handful of people that have had, you know, 
negative reactions where uh, they think that I'm uh, defending the NFL in some way, um, which I'm not. I mean, I just got done with a four year lawsuit with them. So it's like, you know, they're not exactly my friends, but at the same time, uh, yeah, there's a lot of mixed emotions about something that's so inconclusive as a disease process. So you can just start, you, you can start to tell people who have familiarized themselves with the scientific concept of CTE and those who have just allowed other people to tell them what it is. Uh, and become argumentative in text, email, comment sections, whatever it is. So now that the documentary is out, what's next for you? And do you have any more projects either in the works or just ones that you're thinking of? Yeah, just ones that I'm thinking of. I mean, I have like, you know, tons of notebooks. I mean, if you if I were to turn the camera around on my desk here, you know, you'd see, you know, a disheveled, crazy person. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I have tons of ideas uh, and they're not even in the medium of film. You know, I'm looking at a sculpture project here that we kind of stopped halfway through and we might revamp later. I'm looking at, uh, you know, uh, a farm project that, you know, we've been working on and uh, redoing and remodeling this farm uh, uh, for the past two, two and a half years. Um, but in the area of film, I mean, I've been racing a lot lately, racing cars. And so that kind of makes me want to film some of that, but it just, I don't know, racing seems kind of sacred to me right now. And it's like, if you bring a camera into that, then it kind of becomes everybody else's. And so, uh, so yeah, maybe something with racing, but there's a lot of stuff that I think we can kind of move off of from CTE um, and, and jump into, I mean, you know, my, uh, my, my PR guy always tells me not to get overly philosophical. So, but philosophy is something that I, you know, uh, I enjoy and uh, and would like to explore something a little bit more uh, uh, in depth in that area. So we'll see. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'd like to not know for a little bit because it's just been a lot of uh, pushing things through for the past year or two. Do you think having that full script for that original film you would ever kind of go back to it and now having more knowledge about CTE, you would kind of revisit that? Or do you think um, you're kind of done with that original script that you have? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be against going back to revisit that. But I think a part of the reason I left it in the first place is because it felt it didn't feel real, you know, and that's a part of my struggle right now with like doing auditions for like acting. It's kind of like men versus racing. It's like there's real repercussions for this racing thing. Like if you don't have your head on straight, you're in the wall, you know, and I like that. That feels real to me. You know, there's real G-forces in the car, you know, there's a real price to pay. Uh, and especially because it's an amateur sport, right? Because it's all amateurism uh, that I'm, I'm dealing with. It's a different side of sport than I've ever felt. Um, so with writing a script and then you show it to people and then you try to get meetings and you know i've heard people try to sell the script you know for five years or for 20 years you know and that just seems like you're kind of like bowing down to an industry and like hoping and pleading you know as opposed to and and maybe that's you know and that's 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 cool for some people but it just feels like i want action um, I want to contemplate and I want action and I want to be able to express uh, things because I know it was hard enough for five years kind of biting my lip while trying to develop this concept that I felt that could help people in the real world. So, I mean, it's something I revisit, especially knowing, I guess, what I know now after the, the last five years. But um, I would definitely change some things in the script. Um, and I might try to shoot it myself or try to, you know, you know, privately fund it, you know, and, and maybe shoot it because I, I see a, a pretty cheap way of making it at a, you know, maybe two or three location shoot as opposed to, uh, you know, hoping it gets picked up by some massive uh, studio or something. Right. So this is just kind of like a fun question. Um, I guess being 
a a fun question now. <laughs> <laughs> being in the NFL and now being in um, the film documentary industry, who do you think is the most um, famous contact in your phone? If you have one. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, probably Dwayne Johnson. Um, That's a good one. Uh, that, just casually, Dwayne. <laughs> just casually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's in my phone. It's not that he's going to respond. Not that you're going to uh, go fishing, but. You know, <laughs> but um, yeah, him more than Amy Schumer. I mean, it just feels weird doing that because it's like you feel like you're name dropping. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, well, is, yeah, it is a little bit of fair. a flex, yeah. <laughs> but like, I haven't like spoken to these people, right. you, know, right. people you know. That, you know. <laughs> so um, probably most most famous people that I talk to, I, I end up uh, arguing with, you know, uh, to get them. You know, I don't know. I, I won't go that far. But yeah, yeah, those two people were the rock. And then Noted. this is a question that we ask for all of our guests as kind of a wrap up. But what's one piece of advice you could give for college students? Follow your interest. You know, you, like don't do the Joseph Campbell thing of following bliss because you'll end up, you know, face down in a ditch with, you know, a, a, a bottle of vodka empty somewhere. Um I would say, I'd say really pursue your interests, pursue what gets you excited um, and, you know, has you talking a mile a minute, you know, uh, about, because there's so much opportunity at school and don't be afraid to challenge, uh, I guess, authoritative stances on, uh, on the different curriculums that you're, you're provided. Uh, at school, but I'd I'd really say just follow your interests, really invest in that because you know I think that's one thing that I've noticed is like a lot of people that went to school, graduated, which I didn't, um, graduated and then kind of got a job in relationship to that, you know they're kind of on that. Uh, you you just see it. There's a lot of people that that feel that their life just kind of happened. Uh, and they're just doing what they're supposed to, as opposed to what they're interested in. It's like you had that opportunity of so many resources, so many people that are young and have a lot of potential. It's connect with people over your interests. Um, it's it's really connecting with people over your interests. And because I, I, when I talk to those people that did all the things that they were supposed to do, that graduated, got a job in relationship to their 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 diploma, um, you know, they they always end up saying to me, you're like, you're so interesting when you talk. It's like because I'm it's only it's not me, it's because I'm following my interests, because I'm excited about what I'm what I'm doing. Um, and I just I would implore all young people who have that much social structure around them like Penn State to to do that and really uh, use that time to connect with people um, socially uh, that are in line with their interests. Nice. Well, that's all the questions that we have. You can watch Am I Crazy on YouTube. Jared, thank you for coming on the show. It was a great episode. Well, am I? <laughs> I don't know. I was like, wait, what? That was a good one. You have to go watch. All right, cool. Well, thanks for having me on. Thank Appreciate you so it. much for coming Thank on. Thank you. We will see you next week with another episode. I'm Grace Cunningham. And I'm Shannon Smith. Bye, guys.